Jesus wants to speak, so I'm going to speak with Jesus. Come divine will, come speak in my speaking. Hi folks, chapter 10, Jesus, a covenant with the world. So I'm asking you if you wouldn't mind to read John chapter 13, which is our starting point, please. And the question is, so this is one of those very familiar passages of scripture that is read out in churches all over the world every year on Monday, Thursday. Consequently, we can miss out on the meaning of what Jesus is teaching us because we can be familiar or over familiar with the passage. What is Jesus fully aware of in verse 3? In some translation says Jesus fully aware that the Father had given all things into his hands that he had come from God and he was going to God. This makes Jesus the most powerful person alive and he knows it. Yet instead of taking the power position, Jesus does what we may consider to be the exact opposite course of action. He washes his disciples' feet. He takes off his outer garment and assumes the position of the household slave. This was traditionally the person who would wash the feet of everyone who is entering into the household. Thus, before a person could enter the upper room where Jesus was gathered with his disciples, somebody should have washed all the feet. This did not happen until Jesus adopted the position of the slave. To a normal Jew, this would be a difficult thing to accept. But for the disciples to allow their rabbi to do this is extraordinary. It goes against all normal convention. And there is nothing in our modern culture that would convey the message appropriately, because we do not necessarily have the full understanding of what it means to be a slave. As Jesus approached Simon Peter, the latter refuses to have his feet washed. Jesus makes a firm reply. Verse 8. You shall never wash my feet, Peter says. Jesus says to him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Jesus is telling Peter that unless he cleanses him or cleans him, then Peter cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Consider that a household slave enables the visitors to enter into their household by cleaning their feet. Jesus has taken that position. Unless he cleans us of our sin, we cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Depending on the translation, Jesus says to Peter, you can have no inheritance with me. The Greek word for inheritance is meros, which means portion. Jesus is saying to Peter, if he does not let Jesus wash him, he will not enter into heavenly glory. This is our portion or inheritance. This makes perfect sense. If we do not let Jesus wash us, sanctify us, make us holy, we cannot enter into heaven. Write out Philippians 2 verse 7. So I will read that out for you. But please write it out. It's very important to get into practice of writing scriptures out. Philippians 2 Verse 7. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus then declares that his disciples are clean, though not all of them are. This is because for three years Jesus has been teaching his disciples the Word of God, which is equivalent to a spiritual bath. Read Ephesians 5, verse 26. So turning left at Ephesians 5, 26. To Jesus, to, Paul's talking about the relationship between Christ and the church. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. In some translations, it talks about a bath of water with the word. If we immerse ourselves in God's word, it is like a spiritual bath of water. What does Jesus tell his disciples or us to do in verse 
14. So I think I'm referring to John 13, verse 14. Okay, brace yourselves, folks. John 13, 14. If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus then teaches his disciples the final lesson in this particular scenario. He has washed his disciples, which is a sign, a foreshadowing, a symbol of his cleansing us from sin. Once he has done this, he then gives them a command. What does Jesus tell his disciples to do in verse 14? I've already said about it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so I'm duplicating my work here. You also ought to wash one another's feet. This means he no longer wants us to gossip about each other, envy one another's gifts, fight over gifts, sin against one another, slandering each other, criticizing other. Quite the opposite. Jesus is telling us to cleanse one another from sin. He wants us to help each other grow in holiness. Colossians 3.13 What does St. Paul tell us to do? So, backwards and forwards. Colossians chapter 3. So Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, verse 13. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. John 14, 1 to 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You have faith in God, have faith also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If there were not, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you also may be. These are the same words that a Hebrew male would speak to the woman he has chosen, or has been chosen for him as his future bride. They are taken from the betrothal ceremony, and would have been spoken by St. Joseph to Our Lady before she conceived Jesus. At this point, Jesus is telling them to his apostles, and then to his church, us. We should find reassurance that Jesus has not only prepared a place for us in his, in our, in his Father's house, but that Jesus is going to lead us to that place and prepare our hearts for, it, for the kingdom. It is Jesus who sanctifies us, as stated in the first session on the marriage covenant, betrothal, in Hebrew, Kiddushim, comes from the Hebrew word Kadosh, holy. The implication being that being holy means being betrothed to God. A bit like being engaged means you can no longer date other people. You are preparing for marriage when you will belong to one person, your spouse. You are holy unto your future spouse. John 15, 12 to 17. What is the new commandment Jesus gives to his followers? That you love one another as I have loved you. How does Jesus define the greatest love? Greater love is no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The measure of love that Jesus gives us here is not to do with the amount of pleasure you can give or receive from another person. It is the amount you are willing to sacrifice for another. Jesus provides us with the benchmark. We make ourselves enemies of God through our sin, but Jesus wants us to be his friends and is willing to lay down his life for his enemy, us, in order to make that enemy, us, his friend. What does Jesus ask his friends to do? You are my friends if you do what I command you. And what is the command he asks us to obey? To love one another. The disciples of Jesus have a very simple commandment to obey. The consequences, the consequences of this commandment are very powerful and found in 1 John 4 verse 12. So 1 John 4 verse 12. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. 
John 15:15. 15, 15. Why does Jesus call us his friends? You are my friends. Oh, I have called you friends, John 15:15. 15, 15. I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus tells us that he can call us his friends because he has made known to us everything he has learned from his Father. Think about the people or person you regard as a friend and how much personal information you would trust them with. Jesus takes this human attribute and applies it to his relationship with us. He makes known to us everything he has learned. And that is a measure of his friendship, a complete and total commitment. Jesus does not hold back. Okay, Luke 22, 14 to 20. So read that. What does Jesus say in verse 19? He took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So it's just that part, the part that Jesus actually said. The Greek word for remember or remembrance, depending on the translation you are reading, does not mean to remember as if the event is in the past or is, and is distant. The Greek word is anamnesis, which has the mean to relive as if you are actually there. Thus, when Catholics celebrate the Mass, it is not so much a case of remembering an event that took place 2,000 years ago. It is about reliving the Last Supper and Calvary. They become present to us. Alternatively, we become present to them. We go back to Calvary. It is now. What does Jesus say in verse 20? That's Luke 22, verse 20. This chalice, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. This verse is very familiar to Catholics, so we can skip over it without realising the enormity of what is being said. Jesus is establishing a new covenant with us. Unlike the other covenants with Abraham, with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses and David, this one is not being established through the killing of an innocent animal. This one is being established through Jesus shedding his own blood. Thus the promises are greater because the cost is so high. If a person made covenant through their own sacrifice, we may pay attention to the sacrifice that was necessary. However, this covenant is being made through the blood of God. It is far superior to the covenants of the past, and thus the promises are also far superior. The covenants of the past are almost focused on temporal promises. So the land of Canaan, no more flooding of the land, etc. This covenant focuses on an eternal kingdom in which we are invited to live. During the celebration of Mass, the bread becomes flesh through the power of the words, and that is the action of Christ. When the priest speaks, this is my body, the bread becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ. When the priest speaks, this is my blood, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. The priest speaks these words, and those words carry the power of God. It is not man that causes the things offered to become the body and blood of Christ, but he who was crucified for us, Christ himself. The priest, in the will of Christ, pronounces these words, but their power and grace are God's. This is my body, he says. This word transforms the things offered so we now go to 1 corinthians 11 uh, 23 to 32 1 corinthians 11 23 to 32 now i won't read it all i'll ask you to read it all but in verse 27 what does saint paul say about a person who receives the body and blood unworthily. Verse 27. They will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. What happens to these people according to verses 29 and 30? 
They have eaten, drink, and judgment upon themselves, and they are weak and ill, and some have died. Some people, many people, want to approach and receive the Lord's body and blood, regardless of their lifestyle, without going to confession. Some people want to live their lives the way they want to, not to follow the guidance and teaching in the Catholic Church, yet they want to receive the Eucharist, even though their lives are not in communion with Rome, they are not one with the Holy Father. This behaviour is not acceptable to God, and can bring a person under condemnation, as God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, revealed to St. Paul in this verse. If somebody is living an immoral life, but receives the Eucharist, they come under their own condemnation, because they do not recognise the sacredness of what they are consuming. By refusing such people the Eucharist, the Church is protecting them from their own foolish behaviour. So we're now going to go all the way back to the book of Leviticus. This is Leviticus chapter 17, verses 11 and 14. What does verse 11 say about blood? The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, which is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. Now you can summarize that if you want. Life is in the blood. What does verse 14 say about blood? The life of the creature is in the blood. John 6.53 What does Jesus say about his blood? John 6 verse 53 Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, because the life of the creature is in the blood. In this case, not Jesus as a creature, but Jesus as made flesh. Again in verse 54, what does a person have who eats the flesh of Jesus and drinks his blood? They have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What are the consequences of eating his flesh and drinking his blood in verse 56? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him, or lives in me and I in him. Three times Jesus tells us to eat his flesh and drink his blood in order for us to have life within us. And there in the book of Leviticus, Jesus tells us three times that blood is the seat of life. So why does Jesus tell us in John 6 to eat his flesh and drink his blood, yet in Leviticus he tells us not to drink blood? One of the things that the law or the Torah does is to reveal the nature of sin, that sin kills. Sin leads to death. The life of every creature is in the creature's blood. And as every creature is subject to the kingdom of darkness and thus to death, then the blood of every creature carries death. Sin, sickness and disease are all carried in blood. However, when Jesus comes, he is free from sin and its effects. So by eating his flesh and drinking his blood, the opposite takes place. We receive life. Luke 23, 39-46, the Garden of Gethsemane. Going out, he went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not undergo the test. After withdrawing about a stone's throw from them and kneeling, he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Still not my will, but yours be done. And to strengthen him, an angel from heaven appeared to him. He was in such agony, and he prayed so fervently, that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he rose from that prayer and returned to his disciples, he found them sleeping from grief, and he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not undergo the test. The word Gethsemane consists of Gath equals wine, Sheman equals oil. The two words combine to produce wine and oil press. This takes place on the Mount of Olives, where the full anointing of his ministry comes down on him for him to fulfil his call to destroy the power of sin. His agony, the full weight of the covenant is on him. Blood flows due to the stress of sin coming down on Jesus. Every sin ever will be or would or is committed. Every sin. Covenant, cut where blood flows. Read Matthew 27, 16 to 26. 
What is the name of the murderer in Matthew 27? Um, so Matthew 27, 16 to 26. Um, the name of the murderer is actually Jesus Barabbas. What does Exodus 12 say? Say by choosing an animal for the Passover. It says to choose from the sheep or the goats. The murderer is called Jesus Barabbas. This name can be broken into several constituent parts. Jesus, God saves, Bar son of, Abba, father, daddy. So Jesus Barabba, Jesus the son of daddy. Thus, Jesus the Messiah, the true son of the father, the sheep, is standing in one place. Next to him is to Jesus the murderer, also the son of the father, Barabbas. Jesus our saviour is the sheep, Jesus Barabbas is the goat. The Jews choose, freely choose, their Passover victim. In a sense, we are the murderer. We are the ones whose sin took Jesus to the cross. We are stood in front of the seat of judgment, where Pilate places us next to the Son of God. Every time is the same. Jesus, the Son of God, is chosen to take our place of punishment. He dies for our sins. He dies that we may live. Now, while in the agony of suffering, the awful death of crucifixion, Jesus speaks seven phrases from the cross. Write them next to the scripture references. So Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 43. Truly I say to me, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Mark fifteen thirty four Eli Eli Lama Sabakthani, which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John nineteen twenty six twenty seven John nineteen twenty six twenty seven Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. Luke 23, 46. Back to Luke. Luke 23, 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. John 19, 28. Hope you're keeping up. Well, you can pause, can't you? John nineteen twenty eight. I thirst. John nineteen thirty. It is finished. In John nineteen thirty four, the soldier thrusts a lance into the side of Christ, and blood and water flowed out. Covenant to cut where blood flows. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. After his death, Jesus descends into hell and preaches the gospel to the souls in prison. Jesus did not descend into hell to deliver the damned, nor to destroy the hell of damnation, but to free the just who had gone before him. Catechism, Article 633. Read Isaiah 53, 4 to 6, the suffering servant, in verse 4. What was Jesus carrying or bearing that was ours? So all the way back to the prophet Isaiah, just to get it right, Isaiah 53 and in verse 4, um, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. In verse 5, what was he doing for us? He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. With his stripes we are healed. In verse 6, what did God bring upon him? The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of his all. In verse 5 is the word describing healing, past, present or future. It says, by his stripes we were healed. That's the correct translation. When Jesus died on the cross, he healed us of our sin and sicknesses, which are the fruit of sin. 
However, because his death is for all sins, past, present, and future, the healing happened when the fall took place, because this is appropriated by, by faith. In other words, even though Elijah did not see Jesus die, he could enter into salvation, because he could believe that God would and could set him free from sin. The same applies to Enoch in the book of Genesis. The penalty for eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is death. The penalty for sin is death. Jesus takes our sin upon himself. Death dies on our behalf, defeats death by rising from the dead, then gives us his life. John 1, 29. What does John the Baptist say about Jesus? Well, you'll know this one. You say it most days in Mass. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 31. What was the purpose of John's baptism? That he might be revealed to Israel. John was the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were of Aaron's line, which makes John of the high priesthood line. But he is considered by some to be the last priest of the old covenant. When he baptizes Jesus, he is passing on the mantle of high priest to his cousin. John is the high priest who prepares the sacrificial lamb to take away the sins of the world. Colossians 1 15, 20, why Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things are created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he himself might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross, whether those on earth or those in heaven. And how should we respond? If then you are raised with Christ, seek what is above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, none of what is on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ your life appears, you too will appear with him in glory. If you've not yet done it, this is an opportunity for you to renew your commitment to Christ, now that you have a great understanding of the biblical covenants, and quite possibly a different understanding of your relationship with Christ. It's ideal for you to welcome him into your heart and ask him to renew your relationship with him. Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. Jesus stands at the door of our heart, waiting to be invited in, so he can share a rich banquet with us, inviting him in, and spend a moment with him in the silence of your heart. Fiat voluntas tua.